Uh, hi there. It's, it's interesting, you know, having been here all day long, um, the three of us come from a sports background, and to not hear sports come up really once that I've heard so far, considering that sports is, after religion, the most powerful cultural force we have in America, and for a lot of people, football and basketball are religions. So it's, it's interesting that sports have not come up yet. Um, my name is Sid Ziegler. I run a website called Outsports.com. We're part of, well, there we go, okay. Part of Vox Media, which is based here in D.C. We have the holiday party tonight, which is great. The perfect timing for the summit. Um, I'm in from L.A. I wasn't invited. What? <laughs> to the party. Oh, shit, here we go. <laughs> uh, to my right, I have Dalton Maldonado, who is a high school basketball player in Pikeville, Kentucky. You've never heard of Pikeville, Kentucky, I guarantee. Even if you lived in Kentucky, it's so small. Who came out uh, in a, uh, to his team about a year ago and then came out publicly on Outsports in April. Yes. And Lasia Clarendon, who, let me get this right, she was the high school player of the year in the state of California coming out of high school, played at uh, Cal Berkeley. I went to Stanford, so I got to do that. Played at Cal Berkeley, took them to the Final Four, and now plays with Indiana Fever and took them to the finals. Oh, so close this year. So, Lasia Clarendon, thank you for joining us. <laughs> the first thing that we wanted to hit on is, you know, at Outsports, I am constantly inundated with these two myths that women's sports is totally void of homophobia, and uh, if you're a lesbian, just come on out because everything's rosy. And in men's sports, everything is horrible and homophobic, and every locker room is entrenched with homophobia. Um, Leisha, let's start with you. Tell us about that myth how it might be true, how it might not be, and, and how it's been coming out to your teammates and other people in sports. Mm. I have some mixed feelings about that. Um, basketball is always a safe space for me, so it very much um, was a space where I could dress the way I wanted to dress in terms of a little bit more masculine, and I could be a tomboy, and my parents wouldn't let me you know, wear boy pants, and they wouldn't, just, they wouldn't buy me the clothes that I genuinely wanted to wear, so basketball was always like just put on some shoes and some basketball shorts, sweatshirt, and, like, I'm okay, like, I'm safe. And um, I was always out to those people in that community. Uh, I went to Berkeley because I knew there were people that looked like me and dressed like me, and I knew there were people on their staff. I knew it was a safe space. Um, so basketball was always such a haven for me. So then to experience some negative um, LGBT experiences, and that was really interesting, and there's really, like, those two myths butting heads. Um, one example was being at Berkeley, and uh, people often ride on their basketball shoes. Not these ones. These are from Aldo. But people often ride on their basketball <laughs> shoes. Um, and some coaches have team rules about it, right? Like, don't ride in your shoes. We're all uniformity. We all wear white headbands or whatever. Our team didn't have that rule. Like, our coach let us have tattoos, let us, you know, really genuinely express ourselves the way we wanted to. And so you could ride on your shoes if you wanted to. Um, cause I'm not a rule breaker unless there's like some meaning behind it. I'm a rebel with a cause. And so, um, I wanted to have this brilliant idea to put a rainbow on my shoe as we went to the NCAA tournament. Like my teammate and I had the great idea of making March Madness. Like why couldn't March Madness be LGBT awareness month? We do Sandy Hook ribbons and we wear, you know, green ribbons. We do breast cancer awareness. We do all these things that I, maybe in my naivety was like, why can't we wear rainbows on our shoes and do rainbow shoelaces? Um, long story short. My coaching staff, who's been always inclusive, so accepting of us, um, to the point that they would say, you can bring your boo to the holiday party, or they wouldn't say boyfriend or girlfriend. And um, they called me into the office and said, why are you, you know, you shouldn't wear this rainbow on your shoe, it's your senior year, and you're going to the WNBA, like, don't be so gay. And it ended up being more about maybe their perceptions and not wanting to be labeled like a gay program. It had a lot less to do with me, the kid who had a blonde mohawk who is obviously very outspoken and gay. So those are two really good examples. So here you are, about. out lesbian, blonde mohawk, and the administration doesn't want you to wear a rainbow on your shoe because it's too gay. <laughs> right. <laughs> Genius. <laughs> Dalton, again, you're, you're from Pikeville, Kentucky, very small town. You know, at Outsports, uh, I get told all the time that certain people cannot come out. It's not safe for them to come out. You came out to your team. What was the reaction from your team, your coaches, maybe other teams and administrators. What was the atmosphere like? Um, so when I came out to my team, it was the best experience of my life. I was, 
I was outed pretty much. And then like I started crying, but when I sat down, I didn't know what to do. And then I looked up and all my team was still there for me. Uh, I wasn't actually rooming with them at the tournament and they made sure I was rooming with them that night. They pulled another bed in there and they was like, we're gonna make sure that he's in there. Um, other teams wasn't the same though. Like I would hear them call me a fag during the game and say things like that. But my teammates, no matter what the, no matter what happened, they always stuck by my side. Um, my coaches was always there for me, but the administration was not the same. Um, I ended up getting left out of my yearbook on the basketball page of my senior year. And my teammates, it was like my teammates always checked on me no matter what was going on or what was happening. My teammates made sure that I was okay no matter what. So like in the locker room, it was a much safer place than playing another team and worrying about what they were saying. So, you know, what, what, you two both reflect a lot of the stories that, that I hear that teammates are great, coaches are great. But then when you get to the people wearing suits, something happens. What, what is that about? Like, why is it that your teammates that you room and travel with and your coaches, they can figure out how to, how to deal with this, but for some reason the people in the offices just have another issue? Lack of exposure, maybe. I think age often plays a factor in it. A lot of times, the younger generation is much more accepting. I think your teammates spend uh, a lot more time with you, and I think the younger generations care a lot less about what people think, frankly. Like, we're just more like, that's who I am. I'm going to be social media. I'm going to be all of these things. So um, that's what I could think of. Age, oftentimes the people wearing suits are, you know, a little bit older and a little bit more stuck in their ways or um, a little bit maybe deeper in the homophobia growing up in the 60s, 70s. I don't want to get too old going, but, <laughs> oh boy. you know. Uh, no ageism allowed in this room. <laughs> <laughs> but there are some lovely people in suits in here. I don't mean to belittle people in suits. I almost woe in myself. I chose this. Uh, well, it's interesting. You talk about the familiarity, right? And, 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 and to me, the, po the, the power of coming out is so important. Dalton, uh, tell us about kind of, since you've come out, what you've become to the LGBT community, the LGBT athletes around the country. Who do you hear from? How many do you hear from? Um, I'd say I've heard from about 2,000 athletes, wow. and mostly it's like them talking about uh, being afraid that their teammates aren't going to accept them, or their coaches aren't going to accept them, and then they talk about like hearing my experience that my teammates and my coaches did accept me. It helped them understand and helps them uh, feel like it can happen with them too, because their teammates have known them their whole life and can realize that they're still the same person no matter what. Is there a, is there a can you, you, fear? So it sounds like fear is the consistent theme that they say. Is it fear of something in particular or fear of just the unknown? Um, I think it's just the fear of, I think it's yourself mostly, like not being loved or being accepted, and they're just afraid their teammates may shun them or look at them different. You know, it's interesting, Leja. Again, I hear this fear all the time that athletes have and, and people have of coming out in basketball player in Kentucky, right? Should not be able to come out. Um, but when people do come out in sports, again, every single time at OutSports that we've run a story, it's been overwhelmingly positive. W what is the disconnect between what is in a closeted athletes? And I use the term closeted. I know people hate that term. I, it's just, I'm, I'm just going to keep using it, but <laughs> I, I'm acknowledging that it's not the perfect term. Um, <clears throat> between a closeted athletes mindset and and the reality that so many athletes face from their teammates when they come out which is already much acceptance mm -hmm. I think you have you know perceived barriers versus real barriers and how do you untangle them when you've been in the closet for so long for example my partner and I just came out in the last like officially out out in the last few months and she it wasn't as scary as she thought and so it was like I kept like being such a good like partner and girlfriend because I've been so damn out and I was like kind of back in dealing with the relationship and so I just kind of keep nudging her and I want to like kick her over the edge <laughs> and she finally came out and so it was just she was and now she's like telling me about oh we need to come out and I'm looking at her like you know those perceived barriers are like a lot harder to overcome than you think and it's the fear and when you 
when there's unknown, your mind just thinks the worst. You think people are going to hate you, you're going to ostracize you, you're going to stigmatize you, maybe violence, which are all very real things that do happen, but I think your mind just, she was out to everyone at work, and it's just the perceived barriers, I think, really um, take over. There, we have somebody in the audience who I want to acknowledge. Kirk Walker was the head softball coach at Oregon State and is now an assistant softball coach at UCLA. And I kind of wanted to ask Kirk just a question. I know that you're not up here with us, but Kirk uh, helps run uh, Quality Coaching Alliance and has been a, a, was, was either the first or second, depending on who you ask, Division I head coach to ever come out as LGBT. I wanted to ask you about the, the, the fear from a coach's perspective. Because so, we have few athletes coming up. We have, even have fewer coaches coming up. Yeah, the, um, <clears throat> the interesting thing is it's, it's, uh, my experience has been it's, it was that perceived fear was the greatest obstacle. Um, and for me, it was coming out was a simple process of me just no longer hiding it, no longer denying it. And um, that, that fear, though, kind of goes to it, it, are my athletes going to not listen? Are they not going to trust what I have to say? Am I going to be devalued in some way? in my expertise that I've worked so hard to create. And um, well, obviously what we, what we come to find is that actually we become more accessible to our athletes. We become more, um, I guess, greater integrity in what we're speaking about with diversity. So it's interesting right now in college sports that there are so many college coaches which are fearful of that next step. And uh, they may be out to their players and they may be living, in certainly in women's sports, living a fairly open, and I'll say it privately out, um, situation where everyone knows, but they've failed to make that public statement. And um, it is, it's about fear of, of losing the recruit, a fear of, of losing a job. But um, my experience in the last 10 years has been that that's completely unrealized fears. So kind of circling back to, to, to where we started, um, the, the perception that there's no homophobia in women's sports. Uh, could anybody guess how many uh, out lesbian basketball coaches there are in Division I in this country? How many? How many? Zero. How many? Zero. zero, correct. The only one there was was fired last February. So there are now zero. Now, think about this. When I've, I've, I've asked a lot of people in the coaching profession and outside the coaching profession in sports, what percentage do you think of head coaches in women's basketball in the NCAA are LGBT? And I've asked people in coaches who know other coaches. And the number ranges anywhere from about a third to 85%. <laughs> so, but this is not, it's not a joke. This is, these, are very, these are serious people. They know these people. So how do we get from a place in men's and women's sports where when you have a, either a large minority or majority of people who are LGBT, how do we get them over this fear of the unknown? And, and I guess, you know, for the, there, there are kind of two things come to mind for me. One is the role of allies, you know, allies being, uh, and what their role should be behind the scenes, out front, talking to the media, or B, the role of just more people coming out, because it seems every time somebody comes out, it inspires somebody else to do so. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've talked about it before, I think, and it's not to push people out of the closet, but it, we very much, we need people to come out, like, You've talked, you said, if every coach ranging to what, 25 to 85% came out tomorrow, like there wouldn't be a problem anymore. But I'm really big on the ally push. And um, I know there's teams like UConn who've done the, is it the You Can Play videos or and uh, Notre Dame's. But my whole thing with the negative recruiting is where are the straight married coaches who have nothing to lose? Why aren't they the ones standing up and speaking out and not letting this happen? And I was talking backstage, and, and we were discussing how it's almost a landmine now to use that against someone, that, and that's the point that I hope we can get to, and that I always try to inspire athletes, and everyone, it's like we all have that policing of like not letting people use transphobic language or things against disability, p people with disabilities, and um, so I, I've been wanting to write an article about it, actually, and I might just Facebook post about it, but about the role of allies, and I expect a lot more from them, because there are friends behind the scenes. They're all buddy-buddy with the coaches who are in the closet, but then they're not the ones to speak up and say something when they hear, you know, maybe calling Cal the gay program or calling X, Y, and Z, you know, lesbian, but she is a husband, things like that. I think they got to speak up more for us. Yeah, Dalton, when you were struggling 
uh, in Pikeville. Um, where were you looking for inspiration? Was it to uh, non-LGBT people offering support? Or was it to seeing the stories of other LGBT athletes who were being accepted by their teammates? Um, I think it was the athletes, because I had actually saw one of your articles that you had read about Derek Gordon and just saying how, like, uh, like how he was a gay Christian athlete, and he was all three of those, and he had talked about that. And knowing that you could be Christian and be gay and just understanding more of that concept really helped me to just come out and accept my, even accept myself because at that time I was still not even accepting myself. So to see that and to see other athletes like being able to accept themselves and have teammates that accept them really helped me. Uh, well, I'm going to ask them one more question and then we'll go to the audience for any questions. Um, the role of, of policy in all of this. We talk a lot about um, the, the allies and speaking up and a lot of the visibility stuff, but the role of policy, for example, um, BYU, you cannot be gay, a, a gay athlete at BYU, and some people have started talking about should schools start boycotting BYU? Should, should the NCAA ban all institutions that have an, anti-gay religious policies in them? What, what do you think is the role of, of policy in all of this, and does it really affect how the athlete feels? I'm with the woman who was sitting here earlier. Remember, there's a guy that was against the legislation. And yeah, I, I don't know who it was, but she was sitting here and she talked to like the government getting involved. And um, I was at an LGBT summit last off season in Indianapolis. And um, it was hard because a lot of the religious schools, like I'm pushing like, you got to do training. Like they don't have the language, all of these things. And we talked about mission statements, like how I don't know how we implement that, but I think we definitely need you know, we've talked about protections and policies and policing all day long, and I think that's something that we, um, we have to continue to move forward and we have to continue to push in policies, especially with the Christian schools. I know we're running out of time, but religion is something like we can't pass up when we're discussing um, anything LGBT. Dalton, I know you're, just a little, lastly, I know you're working at the U University of Louisville or Louisville University? University, University of Louisville. Yeah. <laughs> uh, just to just give everybody a quick, a quick insight into what you're doing there with, with LGBT uh, student group and athletes. Uh, so we have this uh, group on campus, which is like the Rustin floor, and we actually have our own dorm space where like we, and then we have we, uh, monthly meetings where we all come together to talk about like issues that are going on with LGBT and learning words that you should say and words that you shouldn't say. And it's just, Having that spot on campus is the whole reason I even came to U of L because I knew it was a safe place and I had ple people that I could relate to. Okay, any questions from the audience? Yes, sir. Hi. Hi, my name is Timothy Kane. I direct the um, LGBT Resource Center at the George Washington University, um, and we have a, a very uh, wonderful "You Can Play" video which celebrates um, and supports LGBT athletes. And I'm wondering if, if you've been involved in that movement, if you've seen how that visibility that those videos um, offer can support LGBT athletes who are maybe coming out or wanting to come out or already out. Thanks. Either of you, uh, that was supportive videos, and you can play project and others yeah. who do these kinds of videos. Yeah, I've seen them. I think visibility is great. It's key. Um, I actually feel some type of way about certain colleges, and then I realize, like, oh, they've done a you can play video. So and then it challenges me to be like, well, uh, you know, like they've taken the first <laughs> um, So even personal experience with You Can Play, I think is huge. And it's a great w message to be involved with that doesn't have to be like too personal. We don't have to talk about too many issues. We can just say like, hey, you're welcome. You're accepted. If you can play, you can play. Back there. Hi, Elijah. My name is Casey Pick. I'm on the board of the Gay Christian Network. And so... I follow you on Twitter. I follow yeah. you right back. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I know. You're the one cow bear that has made this proud UCLA Bruin cheer for the bears. <laughs> it was a rough day. <laughs> but I wanted to say, after your piece in the, uh, the Players' Tribune, where you were talking about your experience in the WNBA with an emphasis on your faith as somebody who identifies as a Christian, and some of the WNBA's outreach efforts, both to have, for once, a, pr a concentrated pride outreach in the last few years, but also the ongoing outreach to pull it, to attract people of faith to games as well, and how that sometimes creates a tension. So I just wanted to ask, what was the reaction to that piece, and where do you see that going forward within the league, and how does that intersection work for you? 
I had a really surprisingly positive reaction. My partner's all like overprotective and she's like, we gotta get ready for the Twitter trolls and like they're gonna hound you and like, oh, I just gotta protect you and all these things. And I was ready, you know, I was like, I'm blocked and report spam like all day, I don't care. And it was so positive, like Dalton's saying about the feedback that I got, the people that just flooded my Instagram, Twitter, Facebook saying thank you for representing us. Um, I identified with your story, maybe this part, but not that part. Like, um, it speaks to the messages I've got during our season of just young girls and people were like, some really serious to the point like I was going to commit suicide and then I, you know, followed you on Twitter, just different things. And um, so really positive, like weirdly. And I think it's because I'm just genuinely tell my story and you can't disagree with that because my story. And um, where we're moving forward with, I talked a lot about this past off season with some of our administration and my teammates about like the family and faith nights. And that's something I'm always pushing forward of all the intersections of faith is like, are we making them inclusive? Like I don't really have a strong pull to be involved with the family and faith night. And I try not to do things for the sake of just doing them. Like, are we making it gay? Like, are you letting us be involved? <laughs> you know? Um, but moving forward, if that's something that I did want to do, I, I want to know if Stephanie White, my head coach can go to family and faith night with her three sons and her partner and feel safe to the point that, um, I think people misunderstand safety and safe spaces in terms of like no one's going to beat her up or kick her out of the event. Uh, but in terms of what if, you know, marriage equality in the Bible comes up, what scripture are they going to be using for the, the faith night? And these are conversations we have to start having and we have to be aware of. Um, it's just the language that we're using and it's not always a malicious way. It's, there's very subtle ways and uh, make people feel more included. So we're looking forward to the family and faith nights, but I'm not involved right now. I, I want to thank Leisha Clarendon and Donald Maldonado, Kirk Walker. Is Steve Reed here? Yeah, yeah. yeah, Steve, I just want to acknowledge Steve from the front office of the Washington Nationals. Hugely important to have out people in the front office. They're the people who are making these decisions. So thank you all for being here. And we'll be around cocktail hour. You had me at cocktail hour. <laughs>